Order. Without objection, the chair is authorized to declare recess at any time uh, pursuant to House Resolution 8. Today, the committee is meeting virtually. Uh, just a couple of reminders that we've gone over before uh, about the conduct of this remote hearing. Members should absolutely keep their video feed on for as long as they are present in the hearing. Members are responsible for their own microphones. Please also keep your microphones muted unless you are speaking. Finally, if members have documents to submit for the record, please email them to the committee clerk whose email address was circulated prior to the hearing. And with that, uh, allow me to say good morning and welcome to today's hearing on building regional innovation economies. Thank you to our distinguished witnesses for joining us. Uh, in recent decades, economic growth has become increasingly concentrated uh, in a relatively small number of cities and regions. This has been tracked across uh, analysis from uh, leading experts. Uh, between 1980 and 2016, for instance, the top 10 metro areas saw their earnings grow 57% more than elsewhere in the country. The top 10 metro areas saw their earnings grow 57%, almost 60% more than anywhere else in the country. According to a recent report from the Brookings Institution, more than a third of American jobs in high growth innovation industries uh, it, within the technology sectors, computer manufacturing, biotech, uh, telecommunications are located in just 16 counties. We certainly want to recognize and celebrate the success of American innovation hubs spanning this country and continue to support their role in advancing U.S. competitiveness while we drill down and identify opportunities to create economies of scale across the country, particularly in areas that have experienced decline or transformations of uh, the, the resources based on uh, trade challenges and uh, different dynamics that have led to decline. The United States needs to remain globally competitive, and as such, we must continue to address issues that are hindering geographic diversity and economic growth, and we must have intentionality in addressing some of the root causes of the increasing social and economic disparities in our country. The federal government has long been a partner in building regional innovation economies through many agencies with different missions. Many agencies across the federal government with different missions. Today, we will be focusing particularly on the role of the Economic Development Administration at the Department of Commerce. And in, in full disclosure, I have worked at the Economic Development Administration from 2011 to 2012. Your chair has worked there. Um, I was pleased to see the, that President Biden shares a vision to support EDA's or mission. In the American Jobs Plan, the president calls for supercharging federal support for regional innovation by investing $20 billion in EDA grants to develop 10 regional innovation hubs. Such a plan, if developed and implemented carefully, could spark economic activity, uh, economic growth, build community wealth, and help close the gap in access to the innovation economy for communities of color and rural economies, uh, and rural communities in particular. We also ask the question, if the president is making these investments, if we should stop at 10 and continue to expand and grow from there. We have an opportunity to be intentional about how we continue to grow and achieve shared purpose in the country in an age of rapid transformation. EDA has demonst demonstrated historic success by allowing regions to self-select what their innovation ecosystem looks like. Now we have the opportunity to build on this work, allowing the for the growth and the, uh, and the development of clusters in industry specific innovation to build economic development in regions that may have otherwise be, be left behind. That is certainly 
an example that we have seen across the board in a place that I call home here in Michigan. Not only did we put the world on wheels at the beginning of the 20th century with automobiles, but we built an entire innovation ecosystem that sprung up around new machines. In 1912, the nation's first highway materials testing lab opened in Ann Arbor, Michigan. In 1918, a police officer from Detroit invented and installed our nation's first four-way red, yellow, and green electric traffic light at the corner of Woodward and Michigan Avenues in Detroit. In 1960, Michigan became the first state to complete a border-to-border -border interstate. Now, our auto companies at the turn of another century are leading the world in electric vehicle technology, autonomous and connected vehicle technology, connected infrastructure, and other innovations that are the very backbone of our Midwestern regional economy. Building regional innovation economies is certainly no simple task. It requires many committed partners, it requires intentionality, and it requires a lot of complicated things to fall into place. Federal investments are needed now more than ever to help build new and vibrant innovation economies, transforming us and propelling us into the 21st century, the mid 21st century where we are heading. We will learn from past successes, failures, and unintended consequences if we are to get this right. The Science, Space, and Technology Committee led the authorization for the regional innovation programs at EDA in 2010, and we will continue to evaluate these new proposals for the agency. We want to thank our witnesses for being here today, and we certainly look forward to this, the discussion. And with that, slightly over time, obliging, uh, asking for your uh, obliging, I now am going to recognize Mr. Waltz for an opening statement. Hey, thank you. Good morning. Thanks, Chairwoman Stevens. Uh, thanks for holding today's subcommittee hearing on regional innovation. And, and also thank you to our uh, expert witnesses for being with us. I think the question before us is how do we spur regional innovation uh, to ensure all Americans have the opportunity to participate in the innovation economy? And that's you know, whether they live in Daytona Beach, uh, in my district, or all the way up in Boston, Massachusetts, uh, or over in Michigan. You know, this is this is a challenge that policymakers have long struggled with, as the chairwoman uh, noted, uh, and one that has received renewed interest over the last few months as we seek to advance our economy through uh, technological innovation and compete uh, with our adversaries uh, and our competitors like China. Um, there are multiple proposals uh, from the administration uh, by our colleagues in Congress uh, calling for significant investments in the development of regional innovation economies. I'm glad that the Science Committee has taken the time to carefully review uh, and investigate these proposals. You know, and we have to be candid. Um, and unfortunately, the history of regional innovation is littered uh, with successes and failures. Uh, in the 1980s, the United States invested heavily in science and technology industrial parks. Uh, many of these parks, unfortunately, were unable to attract the high-tech companies needed to drive economic growth uh, and ultimately ended up failing. The billion, buildings were impressive, but they were empty. Uh, and we need to make sure we don't repeat those mistakes. We need to make sure we don't uh, just throw money at what we all, I think, agree uh, is an issue and a cause worth supporting. I hope we can use this hearing, amongst others, as an opportunity to hear different perspectives and new ideas on how Congress can successfully support regional innovation and avoid the past failures. Uh, my home state of Florida is a great case study, uh, I think, in the successes and challenges of regional innovation. Our space, Florida Space Coast is a key part of, our, of Central Florida's economy. It's created jobs for Floridians in the private space industry, high-tech manufacturing, academia, uh, from NASA's first launch, putting man on the moon, uh, the Florida Space Coast has pioneered technological innovations, has given the U.S. the resources and edge necessary to enhance national security, defend against our adversaries in the 21st century space race. But at the same time, Florida struggled uh, in other areas of innovation. For example, Florida ranks comparatively low in access to early capital. Uh, despite its size, partly because a lot, uh, many of Florida's accredited investors 
typically focus on real estate or other low tech investments uh, because they're unfamiliar with the opportunities in uh, innovative technology companies and equity based investment mechanisms. Uh, Florida's technology sector also faces a skill shortage, uh, struggling to find qualified workers to fill STEM jobs, uh, which is a significant barrier to growth. So one of my goals is to ensure that these critical innovation jobs continue to grow, uh, remain an integral part of our economy, uh, uh, and, we, and we take a long-term, decades-long uh, approach. Uh, to that end, I think we need to understand how to successfully bring together local, state, and federal government with industry, uh, with investors, uh, with educational institutions at all levels uh, within our community. I look forward to hearing ideas from our witnesses of how we can do that. Um, I believe that strategic investments in science and technology and research and STEM education are key to enhancing our national security and economic competitiveness. So I think we have a lot of agreement there. Uh, our committee has already worked together, uh, which I'm proud to say on a bipartisan basis to develop two bills that will double down our investments in science and tech, the NSF for the Future Act and the DOE Science for the Future Act the Department of Energy Science for the Future Act. Uh, I will also soon be introducing bipartisan legislation to create a national science and technology strategy and quadrennial review process. Uh, this will allow us to direct more strategic whole of government planning process um, and put that process in place to establish some priorities uh, and, uh, and better coordinate between agencies with a large focus on also then securing that research from theft, uh, particularly from China. Uh, this strategy will help the US remain competitive on a global scale uh, and stay a leader in cross-cutting innovation. The US must not fall behind uh, in developing the technology of the futures. I believe that together our committees and the bills will help the US remain a global leader. Thank you again, uh, Madam Chairwoman. Thank you again to our witnesses and I yield back. Perfectly on time, the chair now recognizes the ranking member of the committee, Mr. Lucas, for an opening statement. Thank you, Chairwoman Stevens, for holding today's subcommittee hearing. And thank you to our witnesses for your participation today. I look forward to hearing your expert testimonies on how we can support the development of regional innovation economies, as innovation is a propelling force for economic growth and prosperity. And we'd especially like to thank Secretary Pollard for taking time to speak with us today about Oklahoma's Science and Innovation Strategy Plan. This commitment to investing in innovation will grow our state's economy, provide Oklahomans with high-paying jobs, and advance our competitiveness. Oklahoma has significant existing infrastructure in three key technology areas, aerospace and autonomous systems, biotechnology and life sciences, and energy diversification. Further investments in these key areas would advance Oklahoma's innovation and potential to become a top 10 state for science and technology. The Oklahoma City Innovation District, the Tulsa Innovation Labs, the OSU Discovery Building, and the Oklahoma Pandemic Center for Innovation and Excellence are also examples of Oklahoma's commitment to lead in innovation. Despite these investments, there are a few challenges affecting Oklahoma's ability to develop an innovation economy. Oklahoma ranks last for state investment in human capital and 36th place in total R&D expenditures. It's important to recognize these challenges to better understand how Oklahoma can leverage state, local, and federal government resources, along with academic and industry, to overcome these challenges. While these challenges are specific to Oklahoma, the fact is every community has their own unique set of goals and challenges for developing their research industry infrastructure. As my colleague noted earlier, there are multiple proposals from the administration and members of Congress on developing regional innovation economies. And I'm happy to see that this committee is using this hearing as an opportunity to explore these proposals, along with new ideas to foster regional innovation. As we consider these proposals, I want to make sure we keep in mind the flexibility to required to ensure they work across urban and rural areas, coastal and Midwestern states, big and small communities, and everything in between. For instance, while current proposals consider regional diversity when issuing awards, more often than not, many rural communities, like those in my district, struggle to compete for funding since the matching requirements are beyond the resources available within these communities. 
I hope today we can learn how all communities can have the opportunity to become the leaders in regional innovation and help solve some of the 21st century's most challenging problems. With that, I thank you, Madam Chair, and I yield back the balance of my time. Well, thank you, Ranking Member Lucas. And if there are any other members who wish to submit uh, additional opening statements, uh, your statements will be added to the record at this point. Uh, also, at this time, I want to uh, take a moment to introduce our just phenomenal witnesses uh, who have graced us with their presence today. Um, our, our first witness is a sincere privilege for, for me to introduce uh, Mr. Dan Berglund. Uh, Mr. Berglund is the president and CEO of SSTI, a nonprofit organization that leads, supports, and strengthens efforts to improve state and regional economies through science, technology, and innovation. Uh, Mr. Berglund has held this position since SSTI was founded in 1996. Uh, and under his leadership, SSTI has developed a range of services focused on communication, education, information, data analysis, and research. Uh, prior to his position at SSTI, Mr. Berglund served as the director of Ohio's Thomas and Edison program and the Ohio Technology Transfer Organization, and as the Assistant Deputy Director of the Ohio Department of Development's Division of Technological Innovation. But all of that's to say, if you are in the technology-based economic development world, you are connected to SSTI and leveraging their resources, or you are very likely doing it wrong. Um, our next witness is uh, Dr. Uh, Erica Few. Uh, 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 Dr. Few is a professor uh, in uh, the Department of Engineering and Public Policy at Carnegie Mellon, Mellon University and a research associate with the National Bureau of Economic Research. Her research focuses on the development, commercialization, and global manufacturing of emerging technologies and national policy in that context. Uh, Professor Fuchs is the leading Carnegie Mellon's uh, College of Engineering moonshot on national technology strategy in critical technologies, supply chain, and infrastructure. She also uh, was the founding faculty director of CMU's Manufacturing Futures Initiative, an initiative across six schools aimed to revolutionize the commercialization and local production of advanced manufacturing pro uh, projects. Uh, and now for our, our next witness, uh, uh, Ms. Paula Nass, I would like to yield to my 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 friend and the the dean of the the Michigan delegation, uh, uh, Mr. Kildy, to uh, introduce uh, uh, Ms. Paula Nass of the uh, Economic Development uh, Office at the University of Michigan at Flint. Well, first of all, thank you, uh, Chairwoman Stevens and Ranking Member Waltz, for holding this hearing, and I'm sure I'm joined by uh, our chair, Chair Stevens, and my friend, Representative Peter Meyer, in welcoming a fellow Michigander to testify before us. Uh, it's my pleasure to welcome Paula Nass uh, to testify as a witness today. Uh, Paula is the director of the Office of Economic Development at the University of Michigan Flint, where I once, many decades ago, was a student. Uh, she's been a lecturer uh, in economics at U of M Flint for the past 25 years. She oversees several impressive programs that I've been observing for some time, including the Economic Development Administration's University Center for Community and Economic Development, the GIS Center, the Innovation Incubator, and the Cybersecurity Training Center at U of M Flint. Her primary uh, academic interests are law and economics and microeconomic theory. She's a graduate of the Honors Program at U of M Flint and holds a master's in economics from Michigan State University, um, a fact which I will not hold against her, and a JD from Wayne State University Law School. Uh, she's also an active member of our community, serving on a number of community boards and councils, and including as a member of the Grand Blank City Council, a large uh, suburb of my hometown of Flint. She serves on the Board of Education Okay, I'm sorry, the Board of Educational Association of University Centers as well. So Paula, thank you for your commitment to the community, to economic development in our region, and for joining us to share your expertise today. With that, Madam Chair, I yield back. 
And and with that, let it be known that three of the uh, 14 members of Congress from Michigan are on the Science, Space, and Technology Committee. Um, our final witness is the Honorable Elizabeth Hutt uh, Pollard, Secretary of Science and Innovation for the state of Oklahoma. Uh, Secretary Pollard was appointed to her position in June of 2020. In this role, she places a strategic emphasis on enabling science and innovation to impact health, commerce, and STEM education for Oklahoma. Prior to her appointment as Secretary, she served as Deputy Secretary of Science and Innovation. In addition to her cabinet role, Secretary Pollard Pollard is executive chair of Applied Silver, a materials science health tech company located in Silicon Valley, addressing infection control and antibiotic stewardship. As our witnesses should know, you will each have five minutes for your spoken testimony. Your written testimony will be included for the record for the hearing. Uh, when you have completed your spoken testimony, we will begin questions. Each member will have five minutes to address the panel, and we will start with Mr. Berglund. Good morning, Chairwoman Stevens, Ranking Member Waltz, and Ranking Member Lucas, and distinguished members of the subcommittee. My name is Dan Berglund, President and CEO of the State Science and Technology Institute. I'm honored to appear before you today to discuss a topic that I've dedicated 36 years of my professional life to. My testimony is grounded in my personal experience of seven years in creating administering and evaluating innovation programs in, in Ohio, and over the last 29 years, working with all 50 states to build innovation economies. For several decades, many states, as well as municipalities, philanthropic and industry partners have been investing in their regional innovation economies to create economic opportunities. As outlined in my written testimony, Georgia, St. Louis, and Pennsylvania, among others, um, are those that have been remarkably successful. We need to build on their examples and other successful efforts. Those efforts that are working share characteristics that can guide a responsible federal program. They first bring all actors together, the private sector, institutions of higher education, economic development organizations, nonprofits, foundations to work collaboratively. Second, they develop an approach that's customized to the local strengths, needs, and cultures of the region. And third, they make long-term sustained commitments that are of a scale to make a difference and flexible enough to adapt to emerging opportunities. Data show we face significant economic problems. In 1970, the middle class made up 62% of US aggregate income, according to the Pew Research Center. By 2018, that had declined to just 43%. The percentage of population in the middle class shrunk in every state but Nebraska from 2000 to 2017. In 2018, the Pew Research Center calculates that Black median household income stood at 61% that of white house households. An Iowa State University economist, David Swenson, has estimated that between 2008 and 2017, 98.5% of non-farm job growth occurred in metropolitan counties. Meanwhile, the Chinese are making major investments in science and technology. While we lead in basic research, that is not enough. As valuable as basic research is, many people have a mistaken belief that if we just fill the pipeline with basic research, it'll somehow magically make it into the marketplace throughout the U.S. It takes more than magic. It takes hard work and resources that right now are coming primarily from states and universities to identify the research with commercial potential, fund proof of concept, and actually get the technology to the private sector. We know this work can be done successfully because we're seeing it done at the local level. So what do we need to do? Uh, there's 40 years of experience at the state and local level on approaches to build innovation economies. We need a national strategy and the funding to take those lessons and implement them in a sustained effort to bring this work to scale and in all areas of the country. 
We need bold, robust support from the federal government that offers flexible funding to states and organizations to build regional innovation economies and transform our national economy. Funding from the federal government that addresses the whole innovation system rather than individual elements of a system would be critical to building a regional innovation economy and different than any other federal program. The regional technology hubs proposal of the Endless Frontier Act deserves serious consideration by this committee. The legislation accomplishes much of what I've described above with specific focus on entrepreneurship and business development, technology maturation, and workforce. The legislation as it passed through the Senate Commerce Committee could support dozens of hubs that are focused and large enough to have a meaningful impact on their regions. The results would be more areas and people benefiting from a technology economy and a stronger country. As outlined in my written testimony, there are specific items in Endless Frontier that should be addressed, including the makeup of eligible recipients, metrics, um, evaluation of the program, and where the program is located. In summary, we can no longer afford to follow an approach where regions are cobbling together support from states, private entities, and single-purpose federal programs. Congress which clearly recognizes the critical threats facing the American economy, should guide a strategic substantial investment in regional innovation economies. Thank you for the opportunity to provide this testimony. My apologies for going over. Um, with that, Dr. Fuchs. 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 Uh, thank you, Chairwoman Stevens, Ranking Member Lucas, Ranking Member Waltz, and members of the subcommittee. Trained as an engineer, I bring perspectives from my research laboratory, which is the factory floor of manufacturing firms across the United States and around the world. Over the last half a century, the global geopolitical balance of scientific, economic, and production capabilities has shifted away from US dominance. Today, China is the largest producer and second largest consumer market. The U.S. is no longer in a singular scientific position of scientific and technological leadership across domains. Meanwhile, we face equal or greater challenges on our home front. Economic inequality has increased and social mobility declined. Central to these trends are trade and technology change. While increased and more evenly distributed science and technology funding is essential for national security, economic prosperity and social welfare, realizing policymakers' multiple objectives for these federal investments will require institutional innovations to ensure our technology investments realize the economic and social benefits we seek. First, strategic investments in science and technology can change the playing field and rules of the game. To regain and maintain global economic competitiveness, our priority should be making products that can only be made here and that everyone in the world wants. In advanced semiconductors for communications, our research finds that while firms can save costs in the short term by producing older generation products offshore, the innovative next generation products hold potential to address national security firm concerns and enable firms to access new larger markets. Those innovative next generation products can only be produced in the US and Europe and involve more skilled and innovative jobs for high school educated operators. Similarly, as the world scales up electric vehicle production, the country that leads in innovations in battery recycling and cobalt-free batteries has the potential to change global market prices, change the global location of production, and free itself from single country supply risks. Our research again suggests that battery production may involve more skilled and empowered jobs for high school educated shop floor workers. We need to invest to ensure we make these and other critical technologies here. Second, to help regions reap locally the longer term economic benefits of research and technology investments, we need to strategically invest in infrastructure now. Nationwide investments in the infrastructure of the future hold promise not only to improve security, productivity, and equity, but also to revitalize the U.S. worker skills and manufacturing ecosystems necessary to manufacture the products of the future. 
the Mason Foreman engineer and computer science skills relevant to intelligent transportation and urban infrastructure systems have corollaries in resilient grid infrastructure, privacy-preserving health infrastructure, and intelligent manufacturing. Our investments and trainings should be strategic to leverage these overlaps and the career transitions between them. Third, the U.S. must invest in the intellectual foundations, data infrastructure, and analytic capabilities necessary to inform technology investments. Research by ourselves and many others shows that inadequate data and analytic capability is weakening government decision-making regarding critical technologies, supply chains, and infrastructure. Our research demonstrated the possibility of using text processing of public information to substantially improve the government's real-time situational awareness of critical medical supply chains during COVID. In other work, we are leveraging new tools to quantify the skills required for emerging technologies before large-scale investments are made and to better understand skill crosswalks that enable firm pivots and skill transitions. The executive branch, legislative branch, and all agencies need access to and to be informed by the data and analytics today's technology and public-private collaborations could make possible. Finally, the U.S. should create a nimble entity with national technology strategy as its mission. U.S. agencies are single mission driven. And yet, technology investments by their very nature simultaneously affect security, economic competitiveness, and social welfare, including health, environment, and equity. Regional investments in research and development, in infrastructure of the future, and local economic development have the potential to have their investments multiplied if thoughtfully linked. A new directorate focused on national technology strategy will need to be empowered to influence and have incentives to collaborate with the excellent mission-oriented agencies in our government. Getting these investments right is non-trivial, but as we've shown in our research, win-win solutions exist. This directorate must be backed by the star-studded interdisciplinary data and analytic team necessary to make trade-offs transparent and help policymakers ensure the security and welfare of all citizens in our nation. Thank you, Dr. Fuchs. And we're Glad to hear from you in Congress today, and we're hoping the White House has you on speed dial, too. Uh, and with that, we'll, uh, we'll hear from Ms. Nass. Thank you very much, Chairwoman Stevens, Ranking Member Lucas, and Ranking Member Waltz, and distinguished members of the subcommittee, including Congressman Kilby, who represents New York City. Thank you for the opportunity to testify before the subcommittee today. My name is Paula Nass, and I serve as the Director of the Office of Economic Development at the University of Michigan Flint where the U of M Flint EDA University Center for Community and Economic Development is housed. It is an honor to share my views. About Madam, Madam Chair, I, I can barely hear her. Is, um, yeah, thank you. Uh, Congresswoman Moore is recognized. I, I have 2020 vision. I don't know what the hearing is. I was having a little problems hearing too with you, um, Ms. Nas, so maybe you could just speak a little bit closer to the microphone. Okay, sure. Thank you. It is an honor to share my views. Are you able to hear me better? It is an honor to share my views about the importance of the Economic Development Administration's support for the development of regional innovation economies. The U of M Plant EDA University Center for Community and Economic Development coordinates, informs, and contributes to economic development efforts that cultivate innovation, support proof of concept development, and commercialization and provide employer-identified workforce development programs needed to build and sustain a resilient, inclusive economy. Research on building effective innovation ecosystems points to the importance of interactions among key actors in the region. Typically, these include institutions of higher education, industry, government, funders, and economic development organizations, among others. There is also consensus on the need for other elements, a research and development ecosystem, access to capital, mentors, innovation labs, and training programs. These are all necessary conditions for creating an environment that spurs innovation and contributes to regional economic growth. What is often left out of this equation is a fundamental issue of how one enters this complex system and what those barriers to entry are. At the University of Michigan Flint, we think about how we, as key players in the innovation ecosystem, make a concerted effort to minimize or completely eliminate barriers to entry. 
And once an innovator has entered the ecosystem, we are mindful of how to best provide them with the tools and knowledge needed to navigate the system. The development of regional innovation economies can be an engine of economic growth. But if that growth is going to be sustainable, we must provide avenues of access to those who are at risk of being left out, particularly innovators from underserved communities in both urban and rural areas. Much of the work of U of M Flint's EDA University Center is dedicated to solving these issues. Through U of M Flint EDA University Center, we've had the opportunity to serve as an entry point for a diverse group of regional entrepreneurs, delivering services to over 2,000 individuals over the past five years. One such individual is a community member named Linda, who was inspired by her deaf mother to create a technology to help deaf and hard of hearing communities. Linda launched an emerging technology company, Bell Tech Communications, which has developed English to ASL real-time translation software and hardware that removes learning barriers by teaching ASL speakers English grammar and sentence structure in addition to the ASL equivalent translation. Bell Tech has been supported by our staff through ongoing one-on-one -on -one counseling workshops and resource connections, including personnel and funding opportunities. Linda is an excellent example of a local innovator who may not have entered the ecosystem without the support of our EDA University Center. In addition to minimizing barriers to entry in the ecosystem, our EDA University Center is working to build a strong foundation for a sustainable innovation economy by creating programs that foster the entrepreneurial and innovation mindset. We have developed a suite of offerings that introduce campus and community partners of all ages to entrepreneurship and innovation. Through programs on U of M Flint's campus, such as Faculty Innovation Fellows, an interdisciplinary innovation capstone course, and student innovation programs for our community partners, we introduced entrepreneurship at an early age. We created the Young Sharks and Junior Sharks curricula and pitch competitions for elementary and middle school students. And we are confident that today's efforts to create awareness of the importance of innovation will have long-term benefits for the economy. As we collectively think about best practices for building strong and inclusive innovation economies, we need to keep in mind the perspective of our population and what people need in terms of support systems, what they need in terms of making sure that everybody has access to everything they need to move their innovations forward. Through programs like this, we know that we will be able to keep in mind that solutions are not one size fits all. We need to provide entry points into the ecosystem and supports to ensure that opportunities are shared broadly through widespread participation in both planning and implementing innovation initiatives. Thank you again for the opportunity to testify today. I look forward to answering your questions. It's fabulous. And with that, Secretary Pollard. Madam Chair Stevens and Ranking Member Waltz, House Science Committee Ranking Member Lucas, thank you for the opportunity to speak today. My name is Elizabeth Pollard and I have the honor of serving as Secretary of Science and Innovation for the state of Oklahoma. In addition, I serve as a C-suite executive with decades of experience working in Silicon Valley and understand how to bring capital and investment together to meet market needs. I'm here today to discuss Oklahoma and its expanding innovation ecosystem. There is a confluence of forces within state leadership, industry partners, higher ed, and the philanthropic community to grow Oklahoma's innovation economy. To ensure this vision for our state becomes a reality, the state of Oklahoma released its new science and innovation strategic plan. Under the governor's leadership, this plan outlines the vision for establishing Oklahoma as a global leader in scientific research and innovation through state-of-the-art research facilities, cutting-edge technology, and progressive partnerships. Today, our state ranks first among other states in terms of cost of living, second in terms of cost of doing business. Oklahoma also ranks third in economic outlook, with low-income tax rates ranking sixth in the nation for tax burden per capita, and the state has developed a strategic plan to leverage these assets. The plan is focused on three key sectors where we have expertise. One, energy diversification. Oklahoma has a long and rich history as a leader in oil and gas research and exploration and continues to lead the way in these areas. Oklahoma is also increasing its focus in environmentally friendly alternative energy solutions to support the needs of the changing globe. We're ranked best state to own an electric vehicle and ranked third in the nation for electricity generated by wind. Second, aerospace and autonomous systems. 
Today, Oklahoma is home to FAA's Mike Maroney Aeronautical Center, Tinker Air Force Base, and the sustainment headquarters of the United States Air Force, and many aviation, aerospace, and cyber-related companies. We have strong university programs across aerospace, including Oklahoma State University's rocket test site and international space station projects through NASA's EPSCoR program. And third, biotechnology and life sciences. We have had significant biotech research and development activity underway for decades. Some examples include the University of Oklahoma's Comprehensive Health System and NCI Cancer Center, Oklahoma State University's Human and Animal Schools of Medicine with a focus on One Health, and many other uh, groups such as Oklahoma Medical Research Foundation, Oklahoma Blood Institute, Noble Research, and so on. The Science and Innovation Strategic Plan for the state um, lays out Oklahoma's innovation opportunities and recommends seven strategic goals to ensure solid foundation and serve as a catalyst for growth. First, to establish the Office of Science and Innovation to facilitate meaningful collaborations and the collection and anal analysis of data. Second, to focus on these strategic industries um, and large scale focus investments and partnerships. Third, establish centers of excellence in research to ensure Oklahoma's economic competitiveness and leadership. Fourth, create super clusters of innov innovation and support systems with focus areas in both urban and rural communities to develop as super clusters for innovation. Fifth, establish a federally funded research laboratory. Sixth, Invest in education, workforce development, and internship programs to ensure diversity in workforce. And seven, secure public and private financing to fund all of these recommendations. Today, the state funds entrepreneurs, researchers, and companies to help commercialize their technologies and grow their businesses through the Oklahoma Center for the Advancement of Science and Technology and I2E, a nationally recognized private not-for-profit corporation, and the Oklahoma Manufacturing Alliance. These bold long-term strategies work together to build a dynamic research infrastructure and attract, retain, and empower a diverse and talented workforce in our state. One specific case example is a recently established Oklahoma Pandemic Center, which was created in response to the COVID-19 pandemic, a first-of-its-kind collaborative and immersive campus located in the heart of the U.S., bringing cutting-edge science to the fields of human, animal, and environmental health. As a largely rural and agricultural state, Oklahoma is uniquely positioned to capture the benefits of animal science insights as a tool to improve human health and prevent the spread of disease to humans. Madam Chair Stevens, Ranking Member Waltz, House Science Committee Ranking Member Lucas, thank you again for the opportunity to speak today. Thank you for your efforts to explore ways federal agencies can support the development of innovation economies in states like Oklahoma. We urge you to consider funding timelines to better align with smaller states' needs, their legislative cycles, and to invest in diverse states with rural, urban, and tribal representation, like Oklahoma. This is a new era in Oklahoma, one that embraces and leverages our state's unique assets to make Oklahoma a top 10 state for innovation. I appreciate your consideration and welcome any questions you may have. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you so much. And we, we know SSTI is very familiar with your I2E program and, and a lot of your best practices. Um, so with that, um, after these phenomenal uh, testimonies, we're going to begin our, our first round of questions. Chair is going to recognize herself for uh, five minutes. And um, Mr. Berglund, I wanted to start with you um, in your um, written testimony, which I encourage my my committee uh, members to uh, review uh, in it all 12 pages. Um, I, I wanted to reference something that you touched on at the beginning of your written testimony with Dr. Anna Lee Saxon's, um, Sack Saxonian's uh, book, Regional Advantage, where, quote, she said, you know, she described the origins, growth, and differentiators of Silicon Valley and Route 128. Silicon Valley and Route 128 were or were not planned as technology hubs, but they did not happen by accident either. And so I, I, I wanted to draw down on that and something else that you said in your testimony, which is you talked about the need for flexible funding. And and I, I'm just wondering if if you could describe that nexus between flexibility at the federal level and the intentionality that comes from a region. 
because we talk a lot about not being too top down and prescriptive prescriptive. So if we're going to fund these regional innovation clusters, how do we meet what the needs are at the at the local level? So I'll let you start. And I, you know, if Ms. Nass wants to get into I, you know, I know you're touching some of that as well. That'd be great. Uh, thank you, uh, Chairwoman Stevens, for the question. Um, in terms of flexibility, I think the issue really is that there's just very great variation between the regions. Um, so using some of the examples from my written testimony, if you look at what Georgia did in the Georgia research lines uh, at the creation of GRA, part of the state's concern, part of the business community's concern was that they didn't have the research capability. And so they invested first in building up their intellectual infrastructure. And then as time progressed, as that strength emerged, it then invested in bringing the technology from the university into the marketplace. Um, and then as they were successful with that, they evolved again to setting up seed funding for the resulting companies. So I think we need to meet the regions where they are with their particular strengths. Um, infrastructure from a physical infrastructure viewpoint may be very important in some regions, but in other regions, that won't be important, that they have an excess of available space or are able to find funding from other sources. So the Youngstown Business Incubator, for example, took advantage of a weakness of the community that uh, they had a lot of empty office space and turned it into an asset by using it as space for startup and for startup companies. Yeah, great. Ms. Nass, did you have anything you wanted to contribute to that? Uh, yes, Chairwoman sure, Stevens, thank you. Um, following up from uh, Mr. Bergen's statement um, about meeting people where they are, regions where they are, and the work we do are very intentional about meeting people where they are, meeting the innovators themselves where they are. So I mean that literally and figuratively. So that might be creating a business boot camp out in the community, in the community center. It might be us going into an art classroom to talk about entrepreneurship, or it might be our youth entrepreneurship program where we embed innovation and entrepreneurship into the elementary school classroom. But really thinking intentionally about how we get to entrepreneurs and innovators that we normally wouldn't get to. Yeah. And giving you the freedom to be able to do that, right, without being so overly prescriptive about the program requirements. A minute left, but with with Dr. Fuchs and, and your testimony, particularly focusing on supply chain and uh, ma manufacturing diversification and some of the weaknesses, I, I just wonder in terms of this, it, 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 and it's not going to do it justice in a minute left, so we might have to do it for the record or get more comments from you, but I'm just chewing on what you talked about with some of these uh, weaknesses in our supply chain and being uh, dependent on one country, uh, and then also recognizing that there are some things in our supply chain that we don't even produce. So let's circle back to that because I want to do that justice and we only got 14 seconds and I've been gabbing for a while and we got some really great committee members here who have questions. So I'm going to put a pin in that for you, but you know, this is just the, this is the start with a bunch of stakeholders in this innovation ecosystem world that uh, we're working on with EDA. And so with that, Waltz, Mr. Waltz, I'm going to turn to you for five minutes of questions. Yeah. Thank you, Madam Chairwoman. And I'm not, I'm not 100% uh, sure who's best uh, to answer this question. So, Ms. Pollard, I'll, I'll go to you. And, and at, I'm relatively uh, new in the last couple of years to this committee and to this position. So I'm just kind of asking a level setting question. I'm trying to get my mind around what the EDA does uh, and its various innovation activities versus what the Small Business Administration um, has done and is doing historically, and where are those, and, and, and I can describe some of them, but I, I'm assuming that you're relatively familiar, where are those duplicative, where are they complementary, um, just, just trying to understand 
uh, that that dynamic. So, Miss Miss Pollard, I'll throw it over to you, uh, Mr. Berglin, if you want to chime in or or anyone else in that question. Thank you. I, I really don't believe I'm the best person on the panel to answer that specific question coming from the vantage point of wanting to drive um, a discussion about how to set up innovation within a state. But having said that, I'd like to have one of the other panel members respond accordingly, specifically around EDA and small business administration. Thank you. So I'd be happy to do that if that's all right. Um, sure. Number one. Um, so broadly speaking, the Small Business Administration tends to focus on financing of individual companies. Um, they also play an important role through their small business development centers as serving as an entry point for any person that might be interested in starting a company. Um, but that can be a mom and pop type franchise, so uh, a Subway store, for example, um, I think of them as the large part of a funnel um, in helping uh, potential entrepreneurs think about uh, uh, whether they should start a business. EDA uh, tends to focus on physical infrastructure because of its authorizing uh, uh, statute, the largest part of it. However, they also have a section that is the Regional Innovation Strategies Program, uh, which is now called the Build to Scale Program. These are smaller projects, um, about $750,000 million in size that last for a shorter time period. Um, so not a lot of time to go into the level of detail. I'd be happy to follow up with you or your staff um, in more detail, but I'll pause here so you have the opportunity to ask other questions or other panelists. Sure. Dr. Fuchs, you had a, you had a comment there? I was just going to add that uh, research on the Small Business Innovation uh, Research Program has by Josh Lerner and others has suggested that it is quite effective in the commercialization of emerging technologies, particularly um, in areas that have existing good venture capital. There may be room for growth in, in other areas, but it is important in that role. Um, it's interesting in its history. It actually originated out of something called RAN uh, historically, which was about research in areas of national need and commercializing them domestically, uh, coming back to some of our conversations today. It, it's a, thank you for that, Dr. Fuchs. If I could just follow up, you said in your testimony, um, quote, increases uh, in science and technology funding alone will be insufficient to ensure U.S. technology competitiveness without a strategy for how to ensure that those investments realize our national objectives. Can you can you just flesh that out a bit more and the role of a national strategy for science and tech? Can, uh, can play in promoting um, a, a more even nation, nationwide distribution of uh, science and tech education funding commercialization? Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, so I think there's threefold there. Uh, one is that we need to... Th we, we have limited resources in the end, and we, we need to think about how to invest those resources. But at the same time, it can be confusing, as I write in my testimony, exactly how to do that well. So I'm not arguing for choosing technology winners, but rather than choosing the right goals, right? So in the semiconductor industry, which I've studied uh, extensively, uh, right now, in the next 10 years, we are going to have a problem of not having hardware to continue to advance uh, computational capabilities, not having the device. Uh, I would argue that funding the last, uh, the commodity semiconductors of today may be far less important than changing the game and making sure we lead in the computational capabilities of the future that even our AI aspirations require. Uh, so getting that right is non-trivial, and there are strategic national security and economic prosperity set of objectives in that context. Uh, two is that when I speak of infrastructure and infrastructure of the future, 
I mean reinvigorating the country's infrastructure from broadband to electric grids to the, the entire uh, system that can serve as a platform for innovation, but also for developing the manufacturing skills we need for the future uh, and the firms that we need to manufacture. I was stunned when we've been studying uh, firms that pivoted under COVID-19, uh, that they, some of them come from being formerly garbage uh, distributors and then construction workers of buildings. And now they're like, wow, manufacturing is great. It's not smelly and it's inside. I love this job. Uh, so we need to figure out how to make those crosswalks in by, by doing the infrastructure of the future, we can build up our dilapidated manufacturing ecosystems to have that um, firm capability as well. Now, thank you. Thank you for that. And uh, Madam Chairwoman, thank you for uh, allowing your answer to go over our time. And I couldn't agree with you more, Dr. Fuchs. I hope that uh, that all of our colleagues can reach a deal on what infrastructure is and, and how to best uh, support it. Thank you so much. I yield. Yeah, thank you. And uh, just as a, as a point of reference, um, the Economic Development Administration will be coming to see this subcommittee uh, for a deeper dive, either in the form of sometimes we do in, internal meetings, but certainly as part of our further record and, and, and hearing process. And it, it is a great question about understanding the differences in the investment. And I, I will note due to my obligation out of fiscal responsibility that a proposed $20 billion investment in EDA uh, is much higher than its average levels of 300 million, right? And it's an agency that for every $1 into an economic development project, some of which are public works, and it hangs out in the TNI committee, right? We have oversight of their innovation pro programs, but for every $1, seven jobs created or, or retained. But it is absolutely worth us being you know, the authorizing stewards of this agency to really analyze and and address the the suggested plus up in funding and what we can get out of that. Certainly with Route 128 in Silicon Valley, it remains immeasurable. Um, and 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 with that, we're gonna go to just a you know a, an incredible member of this committee, um, Mr. Tonko from the nice state of New York. <laughs> thank you, Chair Stevens. Can you hear me? Okay. Um, thank you for holding today's important hearing uh, focused on uh, economic uh, development and uh, further um, in in involvement of regional um, um, innovation uh, strategies. NIST has two programs uh, that are focused on building manufacturing capabilities in regions across the United States. Manufacturing USA and the Hollings Manufacturing Extension Partnership. Certainly, the network of 11 New York MEP uh, centers cultivate the growth of high tech industry and certainly help smaller manufacturers um, to modernize. Uh, these independent, not for profit organizations share a common commitment to providing direct strategic assistance to companies in the areas of entrepreneurship, technology commercialization product development, high-tech business incubator management, and technology transfer services. Um, New York State and the Capital Region of New York are strong examples of where these programs have helped facilitate the integration of innovation and technology throughout the region's economic development efforts. It's estimated that in fiscal year 2020, New York's MEP programs saw the creation or retention of over 5,000 jobs and over $214 million in new um, client investments. So Mr. Berglund, um, what do you see as the role of the Manufacturing USA program and the Manufacturing Extension Partnership in regional innovation efforts? Uh, thank you, uh, Representative Tonker, for that question. Um, I think both of them are critical organizations or can be critical organizations. I have much more familiarity with Manufacturing Extension Partnership Program, which um, full disclosure, SSTI receives funding from MEP. Um, so 
a strong familiarity with the work that they're doing on the local level. Part of what we try to do is see where there are opportunities for the MEP centers to work with some of the entrepreneurship and technology commercialization activities that are occurring in a region. So good example in Pittsburgh area of connecting uh, entrepreneurs working on hardware startups with uh, local manufacturers to help design the influence of that product so that it'll be manufactured here in the U.S. rather than in China. And uh, do you see these MEP centers as necessary partners in building new regional innovation economies? Oh, absolutely. And um, in particular, the MEP centers have um, a national reach and into rural areas of the country as, uh, as well, where it's much more difficult for the technology economy to um, take root. So critical actors. And so what can we at the federal level do to best support these programs so that they can continue to benefit the communities in which they are uh, located? Well, I would say that um, I think one next step is on this regional technology hubs legislation that the Senate's approved that as Chairwoman Stevens has talked about, um, there's more of an intentionality with this program on creating a whole innovation ecosystem. So part of what the federal government has done well is in funding individual programs that support individual activities, so manufacturing competitiveness, workforce development. The regional tech hubs, in my mind, would be able to tie all of these different elements together to deliver results in an area. And in your testimony, you mentioned that evaluation requirements for new investments in technology hubs should follow the lead of the Manufacturing Extension Partnership. And some of the NSF funded centers that do um, these uh, given evaluations uh, annually. What do you think the MEP is, uh, is a good model for, um, why do you think they're a good model for evaluating programs that invest in regional innovation economies? Um, in part because it's ingrained in the MEP system culture that uh, the evaluation is going to happen. It's going to be an external evaluation uh, where external evaluators are contacting the companies um, to get the results. And MEPs also historically been interested in experimenting with different forms of evaluation as well. Thank you so much. Uh, Madam Chair, I yield back. Great questions. Thank you. And with that, we will turn to Ranking Member Frank Lucas. Thank you, Madam Chair. Secretary Pollard, in some estimates, Oklahoma currently ranks near the bottom of states with respect to innovation. In your testimony, you state that Oklahoma should prioritize resources to grow the airspace and autonomous systems, uh, biotech, life sciences, and the energy diversification sectors to maximize return on investment. And I, I believe that's very logical. So could you discuss for a moment how can the federal government help connect the pieces to bolster innovation in these key sectors? Thank you. Um, excellent question. I think that it's critical that we align funding with technology areas where states or regional centers have core capability. The state of Oklahoma being those three areas is, is critical where we have a strong foundation. And linking up um, that adaptable capital such that it's available based upon the needs of that region or state and also is uh, available in alignment with legislative cycles so that matching can appropriately happen at a time when it's needed most. Funding legs innovation and we need to figure out how to provide funding in a way that is more timely and meets the needs of those unique technology areas. I also think that focusing on public-private partnerships is critical. 
Um, how do we leverage relationships that exist around core technology areas? Whether that is with our, our military, whether that's with uh, private companies, and align those kind of partnerships and enable those with the right kind of funding sources to make them really go. I would also then just also add that thinking about this in regard to uh, rural and urban, as we begin to expand our urban um, centers out towards rural communities and create these technological centers, um, we begin to enable rural communities in a way that have not been in our past. And so how do we begin to create technology clusters or hubs outside of urban centers that begin to grow our rural capability and footprint and improve how we are providing education opportunities to rural communities. Thank you. Continuing with you, Secretary, STEM occupations are some of the fastest growing and higher paying jobs compared to non-STEM occupations. And innovation economies rely on steady and a consistent flow of STEM workers to be successful. What can states do to attract the STEM workforce necessary to drive the economic growth? I think that our STEM programs and the programs through our higher ed and career tech need to actually be aligned with the state's strategies around technology development or the region's strategies around technology and development so that you have a diverse workforce ready and able to respond as economic development opportunities are presenting themselves. Um, one of the real opportunities is thinking about not just how do we create the best engineering program, but how do we also create engineering technician programs within career tech to provide um, support to workforce diversity within um, companies that are developing or moving in or out of um, a state or region. And I think if we can do a better job of aligning those programs with capabilities of that region or state, uh, we will have a much better output in regard to a workforce that's prepared and ready and able to support. One last quick thought. Uh, you know Oklahoma has a large portion of the population residing in rural communities. How can we make sure that rural communities are not left behind and have the same opportunities to grow their local economies when it comes to these issues? Absolutely. I do believe it is creating technology pillars outside of urban centers and looking at um, states and regional areas that have the capability to exploit what they already have in an urban center out to those rural communities. I think that also expands to tribal communities as well, which are really important and sometimes overlooked. And I think uh, it's one of the reasons Oklahoma is a very unique area for this kind of expansion that we're going through right now and at this time. Um, so, you know, thinking about how you can leverage uh, setting up uh, clusters, technology hubs in those urban and rural communities so that they're linked together through partnership. Thank you, Secretary. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you. Great, thank you. And with that, the, the Chair will recognize the gentleman from Illinois, Dr. Foster. Thank you. Audible and visible here? Yep, yep, you're great. Okay, great, all right. Well, first off, thank you for having this uh, really important hearing. You know, this is something that I've uh, personally struggled with for years. I, I guess I'm best known around here as being the, the um, you know, the PhD physicist in Congress, but I'm also a businessman who's actually accomplished pretty much exactly what we're, what we're all struggling to uh, mass produce here. Uh, when I was 19, my little brother and I started this company in our basement with 500 bucks from my parents. And it now manufactures about 70% of the theater lighting equipment. Our company was born at the, the birth of the microprocessor era. You know, we had the bright idea of using that to control theater lights. And so our, our company now um, you know, employs about 1500 people and uh, manufactures in suburban Madison, Wisconsin. And the location of our company um, is an interesting, uh, well, it's, it's something that we've been thinking about since its very birth. Um, it was born, our company was born because of the University of Wisconsin. Uh, 
where a lot of the intellectual property came from. And my brother and I got heavily subsidized educations uh, from the state of Wisconsin that they've, in, that they've collected on many times. Um, but a lot of the touch labor uh, for our manufacturing uh, comes from the nearby rural areas. And, uh, and so, for example, our, one of our biggest uh, assembly factories is in Mazamani, Wisconsin, which I would bet I'm the only person who's heard of, um, but is a very, uh, very nearby rural town. Uh, and so it, it strikes me as we've, we've th thought of where to locate things, that the natural scale of this is commuting distance. Uh, you know, our, our, most of our R&D happens in a near suburb of Madison where you can really get recent graduates. We've, we've you know, prospered with a chain of, of recent graduates who, um, you know, they had, a, they had a spouse who was, had a high tech job and had to stay in Madison or near Madison. Um, and then the, when you're talking about, um, you know, the touch labor, you know, the good middle class jobs that everyone loves so much, those, uh, you know, those happen and work best for people who can live in low cost areas with low cost housing and so on in nearby rural areas. But that's a very limited thing. When we think of the possibility of relocating our company to northern Wisconsin, where you're many commuting distances away, it just stops working. When we, we think of, you know, it won't, it won't work because of you know, all the reasons I just went through. So how do, you, um, how do you think about what's realistically possible physically uh, in terms of how, how geographically dispersed we can really accomplish this? When we're trying to combine um, you know, a range of, of skills in this? Um, or, or what's the history of, of trying this? Um, yeah, Mr. Berglund, I thought you'd look like you have the battle scars from, uh, you know, a generation of, of efforts at this and where, you know, what this really works and, you know, what should we be hoping for? What does success look like? I, I, I think, Representative Foster, you've described it very well. Um, it's a very challenging um, issue. And I think the the best connections and uh, maybe some of the other panelists will have more specific suggestions, but I think some of the research indicates that where we can make um, manufacturing connections between research hubs and rural areas, that is the opportunity for best connection in all rural in, in rural areas. Uh, manufacturing just plays such an important part in rural counties um, that being able to uh, strengthen those rural manufacturers is critically important. Yeah, but, but I sort of divide rural into rural areas that are within a, two commuting distances of, of uh, you know, a city and those that are truly rural. Um, you know, I, I represented for for years uh, extremely rural areas, and it was, you know, it just tough sledding trying to get uh, companies with with tech needs to move into those extremely rural areas. Uh, if I could, uh, 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 Doctor Fuchs, yeah. um, I would just say there are good examples of small companies in the Upper Peninsula of Michigan, in the central part of Pennsylvania, that maybe are $20 million in sales, which doesn't sound significant to people on the coast, but in terms of employment is a significant employer uh, in that region. So it's also keeping in mind what size company actually makes a difference in a region. And Madam Chair, could I ask for 30 seconds for uh, Ms. Fuchs to um, say what she so had moved. intended to? Yeah, so moved. Uh, this is one of the reasons I believe we need to use procurement. We need to build to build and procurement a futuristic infrastructure. If we did that in all rural areas, I believe that we start to create the jobs to rebuild skills. Um, and, and I'm happy to talk about, I've been studying uh, the offshoring of manufacturing for the majority of my career in shop floors first here and then overseas and um, delighted to talk about that further. But I've I've become come to believe that's essential. Thank you. Yield back. Great. And with that, Dr. Baird is recognized for five minutes of questioning from the very nice state of Indiana. 
Thank you, Chairwoman Stevens. Appreciate that. And uh, Ranking Member Waltz, I really appreciate the opportunity to, to be a part of this important hearing, and I appreciate the witnesses all being here. Um, and I appreciate the emphasis that many of our witnesses have expressed about uh, uh, the rural areas and how significant their growth and development is because I come and represent a large rural area in West Central Indiana. So I appreciate uh, those comments. Um, I guess my question will be uh, directed to Secretary Pollard to start with. You know, I have Purdue University in my district. Uh, I have had the opportunity to see firsthand just how the regional innovation efforts uh, benefit the Hoosier State uh, and directly affect the rest of the country. So just yesterday, I met with a startup company. Uh, they were wishing to potentially set up a learning center associated with Purdue. Uh, and when I think about building regional innovation economies, companies like this and partnerships like this come to mind. They really wanted to have the access to students, faculties, uh, laboratories, and researchers. And in order to start a pipeline as their company grows, uh, to have employees to continue that, uh, continue the growth of that company. So I guess my question comes down, um, Secretary Pollard. Um, what what do you think Congress should take into consideration to come up with realistic and sustainable proposals to support the development of these new regional innovation economies, particularly in these rural areas? Certainly. I think it is investing in technology infrastructure outside of urban areas. We tend to look solely at urban areas or, or the large um, population areas where, um, you know, technology has already been developed. One of the examples we have here in Oklahoma is now this new pandemic center where we chose to move our public health lab in that pandemic center's establishment outside of Oklahoma City, about an hour and 15 minutes away to Stillwater, where there's still infrastructure from a higher ed perspective, but it begins to leverage the broader rural locations within the state and fosters a center of collaboration. This facility is unique in that it is meant to be a shared resource facility, not only for technology, but also for um, research and development and education. And so working on broader public health education programs for both um, degrees as well as for continuing education. And so in this way, as we establish more of those across our state, whether that be in health tech or whether that's in you know, uh, aerospace and autonomous, um, we create this opportunity to meet a broader group. I would also then add that I think that COVID-19 has taught us a lot. One of those is the opportunity for virtual learning and virtual collaboration as we are doing today. And so ensuring that broadband infrastructure is across all of our rural regions to enable that kind of learning and collaboration is critical. Well, thank you for that. And I, you know, uh, one other thing that you mentioned uh, uh, here today is the fact that animal agriculture and animal research can be an important uh, aspect of contributing to the kind of technology that we need uh, in other areas. So I really appreciated you mentioning that. I think I have about one minute left, uh, Madam Chair, and uh, I'd like to go to Dr. Bergman because he mentioned uh, he mentioned. Uh, the rural areas as well and the emphasis there. So I just give you the opportunity to stress the points that you made in that area. Yeah, I, I think one point that I haven't made yet that I, I should mention is uh, the original proposal on this regional technology hubs was for uh, maybe eight to 10 hubs located in the US. Um, and I have to say, we endorsed the original legislation, but we did it um, somewhat unenthusiastically because of that. Um, we like this version of the legislation because it doesn't put a limit on the number of hubs. So rural areas should be able to benefit from it. Smaller metro areas should be able to benefit 
from it, as long as they're focused on the activity areas outlined in the legislation. Thank you. Uh, and uh, I apologize for not being able to get to the other two witnesses, but Madam Chair, I yield back. Yeah, well, this is absolutely one of the instances where five minutes for questions with this fabulous group just does not seem like enough. And with that, um, allow me to recognize Congresswoman uh, Ross from the wonderful state of North Carolina for five minutes of questioning. Uh, thank you very much, Madam Chair. And uh, I agree. I have seven questions, so somehow I don't think we're going to get to all of them. Um, but thank you. Um, and thank you to the ranking member for holding this a very important um, hearing today. I represent a district that includes much of the Research Triangle Park in North Carolina, uh, the largest research park in the United States, and a premier global innovation center, but it wasn't always that way. Um, the Triangle now is an ecosystem of hundreds of companies, government agencies, academic institutions, startups and nonprofits that work in concert to attract talent, bolster the local economy, provide research and lead on clean energy. Um, last week, I held a round table in my district on regional innovation and the beginning of the park when um, really the people from our institutions of higher education were going to other states. And so it was created to avoid the brain drain um, from our institutions of higher education, including our HBCUs, because we have a very strong HBCU network. And as a matter of fact, the former mayor of Durham, who came back to North Carolina entirely because IBM was in RTP, talked about how um, our African-American scholars left the South in the 50s and 60s. And it was only things like the Research Triangle Park that brought them back. Um, it, the success is due to the combination, though, of the universities local government just giving land, unused land, setting up the infrastructure for that. And then of course, our business community. Um, and one of the things they pointed out is that in order to succeed in the future, there were two things they emphasized. Um, and one was from the, a former mayor of Raleigh, that people no longer want to drive to a big office park where there's not even anywhere to, have lunch. Um, and they, what they want is a live, work, play environment. It does not have to be in the center city, but the center city will, um, will draw the people because it has the stuff there. So now Research Triangle is reinventing itself by adding housing, places to eat, places to exercise. So that was one thing. The second thing is having that talent pipeline that comes from our people starting K through 12. So not just the universities, but having kids get kids interested in things like robotics and particularly um, reaching out to um, communities of color and women to create that pipeline. Those were the two big things that were identified. And um, we know it's a success now, um, but it wasn't initially a success. So I'd like any of the folks to respond to this. Um, we would love for people to learn from what happened in the Research Triangle Park, but make no mistake, we're still ne needing to reinvent ourselves and attract that indigenous pipeline of talent. So any of you to respond to this and how it can help others. I'd be happy to take that one, Representative Ross. Thank you for the question. And thank you for acknowledging that we have to create that foundation at a very young age. I mean, to use a sports analogy, you don't expect somebody to become an NFL football player having touched a football for the first time when they're 25 years old, right? So how is it that we're going to expect our youth when they grow up to be able to become innovators and commercialize technology if they haven't been exposed to it at an early age? And that's exactly why we developed the curriculum we did, knowing that there is some STEM curriculum, there is some innovation and entrepreneurship curriculum at the young age. 
but the gap there was really thinking about the economics and the business that goes with the STEM education, because you can be an innovator, but you may not know the business aspect of that. So that's part of the reason we developed that. And it, yeah, it looked like Secretary Pollard had something to say. Yeah, I would just like to add that I think there's a huge opportunity for K through 12 educators to partner with, uh, you know, the private sector to really develop, you know, boot camps, science and technology boot camps, where students can get immersed in what is happening out in the commercial world and understand how they can apply learning to that and also help set the stage for them making their choices as they move to um, you know, that next degree that they're interested in pursuing post K through 12. Um, thank you, Madam Chair. I yield back, but I look forward to getting to ask my other six questions at some other time. <laughs> Uh, yes, well said, uh, Ms. Ross. And with that, I'll, allow me to uh, recognize fellow Michigander, uh, Mr. Peter Meyer, for five minutes of questions. Thank you, Madam Chair and, and uh, Ranking Member Waltz um, and to all of our, our experts here today for joining us. Um, I am excited on this topic. Just yesterday, oversaw and was there for the delivery of, of two world-class cyclotrons uh, to the Michigan State University College of Human medicine um, in downtown Grand Rapids. So uh, I will not bore you with the details of the Theranostics cancer tracing and uh, remediation technology that's being pioneered. But um, when we start to talk about some of these regional innovation uh, efforts taking place outside of those those 15 counties that were mentioned in the beginning remarks, um, you know, coming from a place that uh, can be derided frequently as flyover country, it's very important that, you know, we don't have that sense of, um, of, of, of failure to recognize how smaller companies, you know, the, the $20 million company in the Upper Peninsula, We, from from an EDA standpoint or from a, a federal government standpoint, continue to support and create that culture of encouraging innovation, um, just kind of from those earliest years on, and from all corners of the community as well. Thank you, Representative Meyer. I, I applaud what you're doing in your district as well. You have a lot of um, really creative innovation programs in your district. It's a good point. I think we need more support at the K-12 level to provide curriculum, to provide opportunities for K-12 educators, particularly in elementary schools, to create curriculum, to implement curriculum during their school day that allows students to learn the innovation mindset, to establish that foundation at a very, very young age. Similar to learning a foreign language, let's start early. Let's do the same thing with innovation, and I would say economics as well, and entrepreneurship. Because again, with those skills, the, the kids learn about critical decision making. They learn to think as um, entrepreneurs and business people. They learn how to build teams. They learn how to pivot if, if their business idea doesn't work. Those are skills that will carry with them throughout their entire life, even if they don't wind up starting a business or inventing something. So I think teachers need that. We developed our curriculum so that it would correspond with what teachers already need to teach during the school day because we realize that teachers are already overburdened with all of the content they have to teach. So we integrated very carefully state of Michigan content standards within that young sharks and junior sharks curriculum. We need to do that. We need to bridge that gap between STEM education and then that business economics entrepreneurship part of it. We need to put those two together and encourage teachers to do the same. And, and you touched on half of what was going to be my follow-up question, but just the other half. I mean, how do you, um, how do you, what are the best practices to leverage you know, the involvement of the private sector in that as well? You know, as one of those likely career path opportunities. So one thing we like to do is we like to bring entrepreneurs, business owners, um, industry right into the classroom, whether that's our K-12 students or if it's our students on campus here or with our business boot camp that we do out in the community. We always try to have a local innovator serve as a mentor to whatever age group we're working with. 
I think it's key for people to be able to see people doing that work that they could be doing in the future or that they're already doing. So yeah. if you can see somebody like you doing it, you know that you can do it. Yeah. And the mentorship aspect is, is critically important. And I appreciate that. And with that, Madam Chair, I yield back. Thank you. Fabulous. Um, and with that, I, I want to recognize a uh, member of the committee for five minutes of questions who I brag about being on this committee. Uh, and that is Ms. Gwen Moore from the other great late state of Wisconsin. Well, thank you so much, Madam Chair and Ranking Member. And I just... Uh, and other members of the committee who have asked such excellent questions. It's been really a treat um, here this morning. I'm going to try to get in as many questions as I can. Um, and Mr. Berklin, you mentioned in your written testimony that the Water Council uh, in Milwaukee, Wisconsin, was an example of these uh, research technology regional hubs. And, and I would like you to lean into, uh, you know, and, and these are huge corporations that have formed this, but talk about the importance of the involvement of the EDA, uh, the uh, involvement uh, and, and, you know, bursting the myth somehow that the private sector can just do this on its own without government support. Um, um, and Professor uh, Fuchs, um, I also, uh, you know, you were, you lacked an enthusiasm in your testimony, but I did get you wanted to collaborate, collaborate, invest in infrastructure, invest in intelligentsia, invest in technology, invest in economic development. Um, what do you say to people who say that we are in a deficit situation and we can't afford to invest? And Ms. Nas, I want you to close us out by talking about those um, who are left behind. And you don't have to mention Dan Kildee. We already know he's left behind. And I would yield for those responses. Um, I, given three questions, I will try and take no more than a minute so that uh, the other panelists can respond. I think the Water Council's a great example of uh, the private sector coming together initially and saying, we have common problems, uh, we need to work on this but recognizing that they needed to bring in government partners as well. And so for the Water Council specifically, they benefited from funding from SBA in the Regional Innovation Clusters Program. Part of the strength of that program is that it was a five-year worth funding commitment that gives more of a, uh, a ramp um, to be able to spend the money. Um, one of the disadvantages of current EDA projects is they tend to be shorter term projects and so can't have the sustained uh, impact. And with that, I will yield to the other panelists. Um, if we don't invest, we're not going to have the revenues to get out of the deficit. That would be my answer. Very, very short. And then I'm going to give um, two short examples. Uh, the one is uh, in advanced semiconductors. Uh, our research looked at beyond CMOS, so the ability to continue computing. That led to 50% of growth in the United States and worldwide in the 1990s, uh, the Moore's Law. Um, we are spending an order of magnitude less today on solving that problem, which is a sort of basic physics level challenge that needs to make its way rapidly to commercialization um, than we were spending on one to three year equipment upgrading under Sevatec. So <laughs> we're like not spending the right orders of magnitude. And that wasn't, we had access to the archives. That was an industry internal dialogue. <laughs> um, but uh, the second is on infrastructure. Our infrastructure is getting a grade of D, uh, right? Um, so when I travel just now through, um, through Pennsylvania up north, uh, there are houses there that don't have broadband. There are houses, I mean, we, our electric grid is, is not at its latest. Uh, it's it's not ready for, our infrastructure is not ready for climate disaster. We have a road that's lower than the river here in in, in Pittsburgh. Uh, we, we need to invest uh, to have the platform and the worker skills to innovate off of. And thank you for the question, Representative. I think it's really important that we remember that 
if we keep leaving people out, we can't have sustainable economic growth. We can fund programs, sure, but if we leave people out, it's not sustainable. So by that, that could be a neighborhood entrepreneur who just can't access the system. Or maybe they enter and they get lost in the system. Or it might be a high school student in Flint who isn't aware of the full menu of career opportunities that are available. Maybe, maybe that person doesn't know about cybersecurity programs, for example. And if we don't continue to train and to provide opportunities, then there's no way that we can achieve the economic progress that we're all hoping to attain. Our legislation needs to reflect those values. We can't just trust that uh, people are going to give people the opportunity. We got to be really intentional about it. Yes, I agree with you on that. And it's difficult and, and, and it takes time. Many of you have mentioned it today that, you know, first of all, it's not one size fits all. We need the very large investments. And then sometimes we need some of the smaller investments. And we know that the payoff might not be today. But if we can establish that foundation for innovation, I do believe the payoff will come in 20 years. Thank you. And I yield back, Madam Chair. Great. Um, we're, we're through with questions. Um, I, I'd be open to doing another round if anybody on the other side of the aisle wants to do it or we can close um, and, and just, you know, maybe uh you know, kind of wrap it up in conversation. You know, we were supposed to go to noon, so we've got about 22 minutes left. But I don't know if Rep. Baird or Rep. Meyer would want to do another. You're good. Dr. Baird, are you okay with questions? I am. Uh, I'm okay. Okay, good. Oh, great. Well, and we've made a bunch of new friends, which is which is wonderful. So, uh, and, and and, you know, this is just the start of our process in the house. And we want to thank uh, Mr. Berglund for bringing up what's uh, cooked out of the Endless Frontiers Act in this regard, because, you know, for maybe the first time ever, the Senate's, um, you know, taking the lead and doing the work on this. And that's, you know, nice to see. We've been at this for years and uh, we'll see what they kick over to us. And uh, this hearing is going to be very, very instrumental, uh, not only in terms of how we think through uh, addressing and answering uh, some of these uh, incredible challenges that we are, are facing as, as a nation, responding to a, a chip shortage, uh, turbulence coming out of the COVID-19 pandemic and our supply chain writ large, but also how we continue to harness the capabilities of American innovation across the board, not overlooking any region or any population, uh, but harnessing the talent writ large. And, and then also determining from our federal perch, uh, making the recommendation as authorizers, what we, uh, uh, what we, what we should invest as, as a, as a nation uh, into these innovation ecosystems. Uh, it came up uh, certainly in Dr. Fuchs's um, uh, statement about the competition that we are in with China. Mr. Berglund also touched on this. It's been a sincere privilege to have an area that is incredibly diversified, that has uh, overcome some of the, uh, you know, effects of deindustrialization while also remaining committed to industrialization with Ms. Knotts being here from uh, Flint. And then certainly um, very profound to hear from Secretary Pollard, who uh, from her perch in Oklahoma is is connected to Silicon Valley and playing the game with Silicon Valley while she continues to harness the full capabilities of a state with incredible assets like uh, Oak, Oklahoma and and so what we're going to do is we're going to have the the record remain open for for two weeks for additional statements from members and I I really encourage the members to include these these statements and ask additional questions because we're going to go back to this record. I know as chair, I go back to the record, particularly when we're stitching up in amendments and, and passage of, of bills uh, through our subcommittee into the to the full committee. And, you know, we're continuing to encourage the, the public engagement with what we are doing in this committee, because certainly it, it feels as though we are so polarized and stuck 
uh, is, is, is a federal lawmaking body, uh, that all folks need to do is look at what we are accomplishing and achieving and deliberating on here on the science committee, uh, as we have great representation throughout this country and certainly uh, the, the Great Lakes region, uh, as we answer these questions and make the proposals of the day about how America will continue to innovate. Uh, certainly, that has been a part of our 21st century plight, and it has been one whopper of a start to this century with 9-11, a great recession, and and this pandemic. But coming out of all of these things, our plight of innovation has not only doubled down through you know, the principles of Moore's law, but has continued to transform the global economy. So we are dedicated and committed to continuing to ensure the success of regions across this country. We thank you all for, for being here. I'm going to excuse the witnesses. I'm going to gavel us out. The hearing is now adjourned. Thank you all so much.